Chang, middle faculty members, guests, and most importantly, my friends. Next time you should sit in the front. The youngsters should sit in the front because the future of the country is all about you people. This program was fixed in conjunction with another important uh, function that I was supposed to address, but that function got cancelled for some reason. But I told my secretary that I want to go and meet the youngsters interact with them. So I came close time and I'm going back immediately after this lecture. Because I find interacting with youngsters very, very important. There are three things that we in India can be proud of. They are our democracy. It's a very fledgling democracy. It doesn't work well. Yet it is a democracy. It, yet it is the aspirations of people, the voice of people that brings down governments, that brings about seminal changes in the country. The second is our secularism. In, even though there have been minor infractions, I must say that India is one of the rare countries that have stuck to secularism. And this is extremely important because if this country has to succeed, if this country has to become important in the global environment. People of all religions, people of all castes have to work together in harmony. And third, most important of the three, is our youths. I, uh, I'm on the board of several universities abroad. Stanford, Yale, Harvard, you know, then uh, Cornell, Wharton, uh, INSEAD, just to, you know, just to name a few. While I find a distinct difference between the older people there and in India, I find that I am also an older person, so I can be very frank and open. I find that the older persons in India of course, with exceptions like Dr. Gurprasad Murthy and Vedekar and others. But by and large, we are diffident, we are scared of competition, we are very traditional. But on the other hand, when I compare the youth of India with the youth outside, whether it's at Stanford or whether it's Cornell or wherever it is, Frankly, I do not see any difference. So, if there is future for India, it is only because our youths will create it. It is only because of their enthusiasm, their energy, their enthusiasm. So, I never ever lose an opportunity to interact with our youngsters. The, the fact that it is the youth who create the future, the youth that stands for values, was very clearly demonstrated in the last week or so. When those of us, the elder ones, were equivocal, were dilly-dallying, were not certain, were scared 
of expressing our views on a very important issue. The youngsters all over the country have stood up for what they believe is right. So I think this is a great example of what the youth can do. Now, the topic that has been chosen today is challenges for Indian multinationals. India has been growing at six percent plus in the last fifteen years since the economic reforms undertaken by Dr. Manmohan Singh when he was the finance minister. This year. They have grown by eight plus percentage. The exports are about seventy-five to eighty billion dollars. That has been growing at twenty percent. The imports are somewhere around hundred plus billion dollars, which is very positive because it means that we are actually investing in building up our infrastructure so that we can achieve even greater growth. Seventy-eight percent of the GDP has been contributed by the private sector, which again is a very, very important data point because at the end of the day, I believe it's the private sector that will take this country forward. And of course, the stock market index has reached an all-time high. Of course, now it's slightly lower, but that's understandable. It's still at a very impressive level now. Plus. There are hundred Indian companies with market capitalization exceeding a billion dollars, which again is a very clear indication of the fact that our economy is growing, our companies have more and more of a global mindset, and they want to bring in innovation so that their companies become more and more valuable. We have at the same time work to produce. A $200 PC, which is approximately about 10,000 rupees, and a lakh, a car which costs one lakh of rupees, which Ratan Ratan Tata is trying to produce, and that's approximately about $2,500. What that means is we have we are learning the art of producing quality products at affordable prices. This is extremely important. Want to succeed in the global marketplace, and the challenge there is: how do you make sure that you produce world-class quality products on time, within budgeted costs, at affordable prices? I think that is the challenge that all of us have if we want to succeed. On the on the sector, on the on the, on the, on the economic. Uh, Data. I would say that we have today somewhere around 100 million telephone lines. You know, as against something like uh, 10 million or so about 15, 20 years ago, and that's you know this growth has primarily primarily come in the last five years. However, we are still one percent of the global trade. In fact, less than one percent. Our exports are only a small amount of eighty dollars per person, as against China's eight hundred dollars. China, each person in China today exports eight hundred dollars, whereas we export only eighty dollars. Our exports form just about eleven percent of our GDP. On the other hand, if you look at countries like China. Brazil, Mexico, etc. They are somewhere around 30 percent. Now, why are exports important? The reason is very simple. If you solve the, if you want to solve the problem of poverty, you have to create jobs. And if you want to create jobs, then you need to be able to sell your products and services. If you want to sell your products and services, you need disposable income in the hands of people. Unfortunately, in India today, at this point of time, valuing perhaps about 15% of the people, which is about 150 million.
Indian people. The rest of them do not have enough disposable income to buy your products and services. So the solution to creating jobs is necessarily focusing on exports. That's exactly what China has done. That is what East European Tigers did. That's what Japan did. That's what Mexico is doing. All, uh, without exception, most countries, or, or without exception, countries that went from a low level of development to a higher level of development have all focused on exports. And that's why creating Indian multinationals become extremely important. That's the reason why all of us have to focus on creating more and more and more Indian multinationals. Now, China has been creating something like 13 million jobs a year for the last 12 years. China has created a whopping 156 million jobs in the last 12 years, while India has done something like 10 million jobs. So, if we have to solve the problem of poverty, if we have to bring better disposable income to our people, if we have to create opportunities for our youngsters in rural areas, opportunity for the disadvantaged uh, men and women, the only solution is to create more jobs and the solution comes out of, as I said, focusing on exports and creating multinationals. So I must congratulate the school on focusing on the challenges of creating Indian MNCs. Now, what is it that we need to do to create more and more and more Indian embassies, in MNC. First, we have to become more confident. We have to overcome our colonial hunger because whether you like it or not, the majority of opportunities are as our markets are in G7 countries and perhaps in China because China is growing at a walk at a very fast growth rate. You all know how our Indian steel companies, Indian cement companies have have gained. Tremendous market capitalization because of the opportunities provided by China. Let us all be very, very clear. The reason why our cement and steel companies are doing well in the stock market is simply because there is considerable demand for steel and cement in China and that is creating, uh, creating a shortage in the global market. And, and the Indian companies are able to export more, the Indian, and, and we are not able to import any shortfalls into the country, thereby the prices are going up, and that's how the Indian companies are doing well. Okay. So we have to become more and more confident to face people from other cultures, to face uh, people who are our rulers, to face the G7 countries, to negotiate with them, to, 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 to sell to them, to create a story in front of them. That is the thing. Second is, we have to become more confident to take tough decisions. If you want to go into the global market, marketplace, if you want to be an MNC, then you have to take very tough decisions. And tough decisions can be taken only if you become more and more and more confident. Now, what is the what do we need to do to become more confident? First, we have to become more and more open. Openness is a sign of self-confidence. Openness to accept good ideas from other people. Openness to subordinate your ego to people uh, and accept good ideas from others. Openness to look at, uh, you know, look at the leadership of ideas rather than leadership of men and women or leadership of hierarchy. Openness to accept good ideas from people who are younger than us. Openness to look at uh, take, to take decisions based on data, these are all extremely important. Next, we have to become proactive. By and large, Indians are very reactive. Because of a certain historical background, we have tended to become more and more, more, and more reactive. We don't do things on a proactive way. Let us be very, very clear. If you want to be 
compete in the global marketplace, if you want to be a MNC, if you want to succeed in exporting more and more, if you want to compete with the best in G7 countries, you have to accept the democracy. There is no shortcut to that. We also have to become a learning organization, which means we have to keep our eyes and ears open, we have to get the best ideas from anywhere in the world in each of the dimensions of our operations, use those ideas perhaps, adapt them, improve upon them. Because unless you are a learning organization, you will not be able to succeed. You have to embrace speed. Because at the end of the day, the one of the most distinctive advantages of a successful corporation is speed. You must ask the question, are we doing things faster today compared to yesterday, last month, last quarter, last year, etc. Very, very important. Next, innovation or imagination. You must ask the question, are we bringing better ideas to the marketplace today compared to yesterday, last month, last quarter? Once you start asking, once you start giving opportunity to youngsters to come out with better ideas, then that corporation will succeed very well. For example, we conduct several times a year an exercise called ideation exercise. There the rule of the game that day is anybody above 30 is not allowed to speak. He or she can write down ideas, you know, they can they can they can then implement them, they can of course later on they can question all of that. But that day belongs to people below 30. And that's the day when people come and say, this is something I don't like in the organization. This is the way we can improve. It's all constructive. It's not. It, it, it's not about finding uh, uh, finding faults in the organization. It's all about bringing out better and better ideas. Next, of course, excellence in execution. Your ideas are absolutely useless unless you can implement them very well. Unless you can bring about a better level of excellence in executing those ideas. Because at the end of the day, what distinguishes a, a successful corporation from a not so successful corporation is how well you execute those ideas. Brand building is extremely important. If you want to succeed as a multinational corporation, then you must build brand. What is brand? Brand at the end of the day is nothing but a trust mark, right? It is, you know, it, it, it's people saying, we trust you. And if you want successful relationships, you want to enhance your revenue, if you want continued relationships, then you have to build that trust with the consumer. And if you want to build trust with the consumer, then you have to build brand. In fact, for example, when somebody talks about L'Oreal, right, everybody, you know, it's a French company, and everybody knows the world. Similarly, you know, if you talk about Sony, the brand of Sony is extraordinarily hot. You, you know, talk about Unilever. You, you know, I will talk about computers like Hewlett Packard. These are all one Microsoft. These are all one true brands that have been built. So, if an Indian MNC wants to succeed, then MNCs have to create brand. In, if you want to create brand, then you have to move from cost to value. In other words, we cannot afford to play as simply cost-focused players. We cannot say we'll reduce your cost. We will have to say we'll bring you better value. All, all corporations which have built a brand in the world have focused on value to the customer, right? As all of you have studied economics, you understand that price is what you pay, value is what you get. So it's extremely important you move from cost paradigm to value paradigm. Then of course we have to create better corporate governance. I define corporate governance as doing all that is necessary to maximize shareholder value on a sustainable basis while ensuring fairness to all the stakeholders. Customers, employees, investors, vendor partners, government of the land and the society. It's extremely, we have to raise the transparency. We have to bring a better level of accountability. And then of course, the other important thing, perhaps the most important thing is we have to learn to work in multicultural teams. You have to learn to, to work with Englishmen. You have to learn to work with American women. You have to learn to work with Spanish people. You have to learn to work with Chinese people because that's a multinational has operations in multiple countries. 
and you have to learn to liberate the power of all these multicultural talent. And of course, we need risk modeling. Unfortunately, most Indian companies are poor in creating analytical models for risk assessment. You cannot depend too much on one customer. You cannot depend too much on one technology, too much on one geography, etc. So risk modeling is extremely important. Next, of course, we, the managers in a, multi in a multinational corporation, have to become much more technology savvy. Unfortunately, in, in, in India, in several parts of the world, the technology awareness of our managers is still not up to the mark. We have to enhance that. I mean, I can go on and on and on because I think all of you have, have set a good standard by, by, you know, completing a task ahead of time. I think I too want to do that. I have a record of completing five minutes ahead of my schedule generally, and I want to close my talk because we still have five minutes, and I would rather answer your question and answers because that's where I think I will have tremendous learning. And I have only one, one rule though. Alternate questions would have to be from women and men. Okay? First question by a girl and then by a boy, etc. 